listen only mode. Hi everyone and thank you for joining today's California Brokers Business Accelerator. This morning we are joined by our Riverside broker Mary Jane Morris and appraiser Roger Dover Spike. Before we, we begin, we are excited about a few new highlights here at AJI. First is our coaching program. This is a program that caters to agents of all levels of production. If you want to be coached by a top producing agent, understand your weaknesses and how to overcome them, plus increase your social media and marketing knowledge, this program is for you. Other highlights are Real Estate Tools and Technology Tuesdays. These are live broadcasts on Facebook. And beginning this Friday is Fun Facts Fridays, which will feature something related to the tools that AJI have to offer. Please don't hesitate to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me for all of your questions concerning our systems here at AJI, or if you just need a refresher course on AJI University. You can reach me by email at support at AJICorporate.com. And without further ado, I will hand over the spotlight to Loan Officer Richard Thatcher of Movement Mortgage. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to speak a little bit about some of the things that have been going on um, with some of the agents I work with, some of the agents that I know. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to putting in offers on properties, um, and the biggest thing I hear is, you know, I'm constantly getting beat out by cash offers. I'm constantly getting beat out by someone who comes in a thousand dollars more than me. Um, you know, what what can I do to prevent that, or what what can I do to give myself a, a better opportunity to win those um, those properties? So we we've had a lot of luck here in the San Diego area with um, with kind of the way we do things at Movement Mortgage. Um, I don't know if anybody, how many of you are familiar with Movement Mortgage and our process. Um, what we do is upfront underwriting. So before the buyer even puts an offer on a property, they have a fully underwritten file, basically just waiting for a property and an appraisal. So how does this help the agent win offers? Well, when a file is completely underwritten prior to um, the offer being accepted, it allows the agent to get aggressive with the offer. Um, some of the things that we do is we will offer a 17-day no loan contingency offer. Um, what this does for the buyer's agent is it allows them to compete with the cash offers because essentially what you're doing is submitting a cash offer um, and importantly, uh, without the cash discount to the seller. Because ideally, when they take a cash offer, it's not full price, but they can guarantee a 10 to 15 day close. If you can offer the same thing and come in at a higher price, it's going to help you win more offers. Um, so, like I said, that's been working here in San Diego. Um, we do that all over California. And, and like I said, it's not going to win every single offer, but I guarantee that it's going to get looked at. Um, I generally will call the listing agent on every offer and explain our process because what happens is they get these offers and they say 15 day, 15 day close, no, no loan contingency. And a lot of times they, you know, they think it's a mistake. So I will call, explain the process. And again, we've had a lot of success um, getting offers accepted that are less than another offer because we can close in a short amount of time or uh, beat out a cash deal because we're at, you know, a higher offer price and we can perform in the same amount of time. So give me a call or shoot me an email um, if you have any questions in regards to that. One other thing I wanted to briefly discuss is um, another thing that, that we've been coming across is, you know, down payment assistance or I have buyers and they have good credit and a good job. We just don't have the capital to put a down payment down on the property. Movement has a really unique program that is um, kind of uh, kind of sets us apart from most most lenders is that we have an in-house down payment assistance program. I'm sure everybody has dealt with Cal Halfa, 45, 60 day close, you know, good luck getting your offer accepted um, when you present a Cal uh, HFA offer. Um, most listing agents in this environment don't want to even entertain an offer like that. Movements is in-house. We have 0% down and 1% down. And because we underwrite and do everything in-house, we don't have to send it anywhere to get underwritten a second time. So 21 day close on those. Um, it's just like a regular 30 day, 21 day uh, normal offer, except we're doing the down payment assistance in-house. It really opens up your pool of buyers that you think, um, 
you know, maybe can't qualify or don't have, you know, you don't have the time to do a 60 day escrow. Um, again, with, with, with that program, give me a call, shoot me an email. Um, I can help anybody across California. Even if you just have questions about a deal, you might be an escrow on that. You're not getting straightforward answers from another lender. Call me. I'm a resource to you and um, have a great day. Reach out to me and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Well, now let's turn this over to Mary Jane Morris and Roger Dover Spike. Thank you, Roger, for joining us today. Mary Jane, I'm going to let you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tracy. Good morning, everybody from Temecula, California, where it is about 103 degrees yesterday. I'm looking forward to some fall weather here at some point. Um, I'm so excited to, uh, well, first let me welcome our, our brokers, our Northern Cal broker, our San Diego broker, and our LA broker, and um, Richard um, from that, Richard Thatcher from Movement Mortgage. I'd love if you'd stay on the line today and take questions because appraisal goes hand in hand uh, with uh, lending, of course. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I want to tell you how I met him. About six or seven years ago, uh, I attended a basic appraisal class. Uh, that was given by Roger and one of and one of his partners at the Board of Realtors. And it was during the short sale REO crazed market and the room was packed. I have never seen a class more uh, filled wall to wall. Also, they were not aggressive with him, but boy, they had questions. I have never seen a class that where people more were more desperate to just sit down and pick a person's brain. Um, I immediately recognized that this was going to be a subject that I wanted to take back to my agents. And so I invited Roger to speak at that time, uh, where I was at that time. And um, in the, in the uh, intervening years, we've become friends and he's been a, he's been a very a great uh, asset to uh, my people. They can ask him a lot of questions. He's very patient. He's a very good man. We're lucky to have him. So without further ado, good morning, Roger. Good morning. I'm so happy to have you with us. Thanks for taking the time to do this. You're welcome. And uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, answering any questions that you or your brokers or agents may have. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. You were able to type in your questions there and Tracy will feed, field them to me. Um, all of my classes are always conversations, so feel free to uh, send in your questions. Um, I put up Roger's picture and his affiliations and his business license. Um, he shared with me his PowerPoint that he used from a previous event, and there was so much good stuff in it that I went ahead and uh, included quite a bit, even though we won't necessarily go over it. Some of the types of appraisals that he is able to do or, or types of appraisals are, are listed here, residential and commercial and land and churches and motels. So there's, there's quite a bit there. Um, I also found this page very interesting because I think, look, this is all the types of situations where you might need uh an appraisal uh i'm a big fan of seller appraisal seller provided appraisals because that locks it down and i don't have to do price reductions all the time um, but this is this was a great uh list of the types of um appraisals um obviously we all know that an appraisal is the act or process of developing an opinion um, of value and there's some details there that you might want to go over uh a little later um, I thought this was interesting too, a good report versus a bad report. You know, it's, you should come to the same conclusion the appraiser did by the time you're done reading that appraisal. If not, uh, it's a bad or incomplete report. And then very briefly at the bottom of that particular slide, if you really have a bad appraiser, and I hear that from time to time, I, uh, where their behavior was outrageous, their conduct, whatever, um, showing up late, ridiculous uh, appraisal results, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a way to uh, make a complaint. And uh, uh, Roger makes a point that this is the only way to get rid of incompetent appraisers. So there's a good piece of information there for you. Um, the appraiser's role, um, as you know, for the buyer's agent is to protect the buyer from paying too much from a property. Um, a listing agent supports their a uh, fair market value that they're trying to come to and of course for the lender that they don't want to lend too much too much money on it um, i did put in the steps for an appraiser that you guys can review when you have time i i, uh, I did not want to read you all this material but i thought it was valuable to have when you get your copy which is available after this class a recorded copy with the slides and all are available to you uh after um so i <clears throat> 
I'm just going to go ahead and get to our first question. Uh, this is the question I get all the time, Roger, and you and I talked about it in the mini interview a little bit. Um, are real estate agents allowed to talk to the appraiser? Yes. Is that the short answer? <laughs> that's, that's the short answer. Basically, um, as long as a real estate agent doesn't try to intimidate or to um, have uh, undue influence on in trying to impress the appraiser with her, their value opinion, um, you can talk to them. Um, the information that a real estate agent can provide the appraiser is very important and uh, it, it, it's something that is really needed in the appraiser's due diligence to uh, understand the nuances of the property and what the listing history and uh, insider information, if you will, that the listing agent or the buyer's agent knows about the property that may not be published and may not be privy to the appraiser by looking at the MLS or or their other data sources, public records, et cetera. I went ahead and put up the Senate Bill 706 and, and I underlined the, the piece that says we're not allowed to coerce, extort, bribe, intimidate, compensate or instruct uh, improperly influence. And I thought that was a really, a really good point. Um, I know a lot of this uh, fear came from the market, uh, the market, the REO and short sale market that we just mostly concluded. And um, I know there was a lot of fear about that. Uh, Roger, you and I talked about this in the mini interview, but can you tell me what a listing agent and a buyer's agent can do to better get ready for an appraisal? Well, as as we discussed, um, Mary Jane, um, you know, we're in a we're in a society now that people want to save money and uh, agents really need to have an expertise and uh, a persona that they are the go-to people um, and not someplace like, um, you know, any of the other services that are, you know, attempting to do stuff, you know, via computer and whatever. So in my opinion, uh, the first thing the listing agent can do is pro produce and provide an all-inclusive uh, listing uh, agreement as well as the information that they provide to the MLS. Um, it will not only prevent uh, calls from the appraisal, the appraiser you're dealing with on this property, but it will uh, deter a lot of appraisers from calling you to confirm information if you put all the information that you feel is needed for a a listing agent to obtain an offer from their or to obtain an offer from a selling agent or a buyer's agent. The um, uh, the pictures that you asked for, I thought were interesting. Can you tell us what kind of pictures you would like to see? Um, sure. Normally, uh, and I find more and more agents are doing this, but from an appraisal point of view, we're required uh, to give a front and rear picture, side pictures. Uh, if there's any amenities in the backyard, take pictures of the backyard also. A uh, street picture is important uh, both ways. Um, and then um, a picture in the living room or great room, uh, the dining area, the kitchen, uh, at least the master bedroom and the master bath. Um, but I tell people to uh, and agents to really take as many pictures as you want. They're cheap to put on on the uh, listing and it in the long run will prevent you from getting questions that, you know, from other appraisers or other agents that uh, you can only have them refer to the, um, the listing to get the information they really are, are needing. I think you mentioned the side yard pictures uh, originally as well. Uh, I, I do find the pictures portion of this to be interesting because I had a buyer recently who would not buy a property with a slope in the backyard and I virtually could not get a picture of the backyard on most of the MLSs um, we looked at. Um, sometimes I had to decide as I uh, from a living room picture they took where I could see the backyard through the window so I think backyard and side yards are, are very important. Um, uh, let's talk about when we meet the appraiser at the property. You recommend that, and then you have some tips for us on what they should be uh, trying to accomplish when they're there. 
Also, MJ, well, yeah, I, you don't mind me interrupting yeah. for a minute. I'm getting questions. Would you? I forgot to ask you. I'm sorry if you'd like me to wait to the very end or as they come in. If you if you think they're pertinent to the to the moment, absolutely throw them in because we we want people to have a chance to uh, not get uh, left behind. So what what have we got so far? Okay, first one from Feg de Garcia. How much is to do? How much is it to do an appraisal at the time of getting the listing? And do you do appraisals for lending institutions? Uh, first of all, if we do it for an agent, which it seems to be more and more happening, um, we we give a 10% discount on what we normally charge. Uh, a typical conforming appraisal, we charge 495, so we would be doing an appraisal for an agent at uh, 450. Um, we find, however, that the agents have uh, one or two scenarios to go through, or maybe even three. The first is the agent pays for it as part of, of the listing pr uh, package. Two, it's something that maybe the agent gets reimbursed for at the end uh, when the deal closes. It also has a tendency to keep uh, sellers with that agent because the agent is invested in the, you know, with the seller in the property. The third thing is, is we found too that some um, uh, title companies that or uh, escrow companies you deal with will allow, um, and some real estate appraisers will allow um, payment upon the close of escrow um, out of escrow. Um, but typically we find the first two, one, the agent pays for it and is either reimbursed or is part of their, their program um, in their listing package. Um, and maybe I try, we can to, talk, I, I try we can to get the seller to pay for it um, or split it with them myself um, on a value, a property of a certain value. I just pay for it. And then, uh, you know, further with regards to do I appraise properties for for banks? No, I don't. Um, I found I find that um, one. Um, there's not enough money in it for me as an as an MAI appraiser. The second thing is, is you're constantly getting uh, questioned regarding your value opinions uh, by people who um, are not even appraisers and they're going through a three ring binder um, and uh, asking questions that they don't see because they haven't read the appraisal or don't know where to look. Um, and so in answer to your question, no, I don't do appraisals for banks. Typically, if I do an appraisal, uh, one or two things are going to happen. It's either for you up front or you're not going to want to see me because it'll be part of a lawsuit. All right, we right. do have another question from Lisa Myers. Uh, if the house is 1,800 square feet, but all the comps are 1,600 square feet, do you make a price adjust adjustment by price per square foot? So 200 square feet in this case, and multiply that by the price per square foot of the comps. That is what she does, but she was told appraisers do not. We do not. We base it on what the contributory value of the additional improvements are only because we've already made adjustments for other items such as bathrooms, bathroom fixtures, um, pools, et cetera. So we're, we're more of a detail. We try to, you know, there are some common guidelines, but basically each home is so different with regard to, as Mary Jane brought up, a parcel that has uh, a slope at the back as opposed to one that's fully usable, uh, one that may have some amenities that are normal in the area, such as you know a pool or you know some type of other backyard amenities. So, in very general terms, for a real estate agent, that's fine. But typically, the market data suggests that the adjustment is significantly different when you're adjusting just for square footage as opposed to um, the price per square foot of the entire. Uh, home. All right, that's it for the questions right now. So um, I'll let you know if we get any more. Um, I I think I see one there too, Tracy. But I for now I would like uh, Roger. Tell me what you what uh, the goals are of the agent at the property. When what should they hand the hand the person and be prepared mm -hmm. to? Um, well, first of all, I, I think that it's important that the agent, both the buyer and the seller's agent, or if you're working together, or at least the the, the buyer's agent <clears throat> meet the appraiser at the property. Um, 
I would re require if I was an agent that the appraiser call me to access the property. It doesn't mean he couldn't access it by himself, but I want to control the situation somewhat. I want to make sure that the person who's supposed to be appraising the property is actually that person. In many cases, we've had uh, licensees and people who might work for that company, but not the person signing the report actually inspect the property. And there's a, that's actually not legal. And so I would want to see an ID. First of all, I'd like that person to call me to set an appointment. Then I would like to interview him. I'd like to find out how many appraisals he's done in the area, what data sources he has, because one of the big issues with real estate agents have been uh, geographical competency. And um, I want to know that somebody who's uh, appraising the property is very familiar with uh, the area that they're appraising and that um, they have various data sources that uh, the real estate agents in that area have um, that other people coming from outside the area either may not know of or don't have. Uh, once I meet them there and check their ID to make sure that they're who they say they are because they'll give me a card because um, I always ask for a card then um, I give them the information that I used in order to either assist the buyer in in making the offer or assist the seller in in listing the property um, and one of the big issues appraisers have is that real estate agents in many cases, do not give uh, comparable com uh, comps. They'll look outside the area or the neighborhood that uh, th the property is in and get whatever they can get in order to pop the price up. And that's useless to a good appraiser. Um, an agent should be looking inside the neighborhood and then in other neighborhoods that you may have shown properties to that buyer uh, and pulling comps there because that really is what the buyer is making a determination of value when he makes an offer on that specific property. Um, I, I would also I would also um, ask the appraiser if he needs any help holding the tape or whatever, um, and I would walk around and make sure that he, uh, you know, does what he says he's going does you know what he's going to do, you know if it's an FHA appraiser. Um, they typically have to look in the in the uh, attic. Um, they have to do a you know a pretty thorough inspection in the outside. They have to check all the plumbing fixtures and all that stuff. Um, and uh, that m many times takes a lot of time. And as a consequence, some appraisers kind of um, you know don't do what they're supposed to do necessarily in their inspection. Um, one, of, one of the uh, interesting points that you made th the first time I heard you speak and that I, I want to like to bring you back to you now and that I have highlighted on the screen is um, agents are looking for comps in the last six months to a year where an appraiser has to create a three-year history. Um, of it's the only property. a three-year history for the subject property. Right, but it includes uh, expired listings, off-market listings, things that you aren't maybe putting in your comps. Um, I well, that has that nothing to do with the comparables. The only thing we have to do with the comparables is uh, for fear of um, flipping, we have to provide um, histories of the comparables for only a year. Okay. We typically do three years just as an overkilling because we're doing three years on the subject property. Um, and that's pretty easy to get through public records in the MLS. And then I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take this question that's appearing on my screen. If an agent and seller are having a different time, difficult time uh, meeting of the minds as to the list price, is you think a seller provided um, appraisal is valuable? Um, I'm going to go against the grain here and say it, it is a policy of mine that I have all my listings appraised. That doesn't mean I didn't do my work. Um, during the REO market, I found it to be very helpful when I got a low appraisal to not have to just reduce the price, uh, but to have something to answer. Uh, well, my 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 appraisal shows this. So, what's your opinion, uh, Roger, of uh, the value of seller provided appraisal? 
I, I kind of agree with you, Mary Jane. I think as part of the the uh, listing package, um, I think doing as much as you can up front will alleviate any contentions of the seller not feeling that they're being represented correctly. Uh, I find more and more in our practice as we do um, appraisals, uh, for residential property, uh, many of them want are thinking about listing the property and don't necessarily um, trust listing agents because their position is is they're only looking to make a deal and they want the best price. The seller wants the best price possible to sell his property. So when we do an appraisal for listing purposes, we give a range of value because we know that. Um, there are different motivations for buyers and sellers and they may change even during the listing period but our our conclusion is is that if somebody uh, makes a deal within that range of value and it's normally within a you know three to five percent range it's a fair value for both parties uh, given the circumstances of the buyer and seller um, sellers reasons for purchasing or selling <clears throat> Two times I found it helpful to have a seller appraisal is up in Temecula. I'm previously from San Diego. We have mostly lot and block in San Diego. Up here, we've got groves and farms and custom lots and wine country. Um, and the appraiser can help me with a lot of um, a lot of information um, that I might not be factoring. So that I find that very useful. Uh, the other thing is during the short sale market, uh, we had people that were very that were very close and maybe didn't have to be a short sale. Uh, Roger specifically helped me uh, obtain twenty five thousand over on a list price uh, by providing when we provided the appraisal up front and we knew um, and we wound up with a cash buyer who uh, was willing to pay twenty five over because they could see down down the road. But um, we prevented a short sale um, them having to go a short sale by. Uh, we marketed it on the MLS as oh, going that we're purposely going over market to uh, to uh, avoid a short sale. So that was very helpful for, for Roger to come out and really help me set the the high side of how far uh, before it got ridiculous, how far over. So a couple um, other things too. If I were listing a property, I would try to encourage the um, the seller to uh, get a, um, a home inspection and a termite report. Termite reports you don't have to pay for until such time as the deal closes. Uh, home inspections, there are home inspectors out there that if you do a lot of work with them, they'll work with you and and put their bill into uh, escrow for payment. And the reason I like that is because, um, and a reason the appraiser would like that is because any unforeseen things that the appraiser may feel are um, uh, part of issues with, with uh, value as well as uh, the attempt of buyers to renegotiate once a deal has been had a meeting of the minds but the due diligence hasn't been completed um, if you can do as much as you can up front uh, it prevents renegotiation and it gives you a better negotiating position so that that point, uh, frankly, scared me a little when I read it in your materials. We're so trained to avoid getting the lender involved in uh, any perceived defects on the property that I was having a hard time uh, accepting that I would want to give him a copy of the... Um, I well, could the, see that you would want it. I could. Uh, the appraiser I had a hard doesn't time. give it necessarily to the lender, but he is, he's able to use it in order to qualify some of his investment. Uh, some of his adjustments. Um, and, and in theory, ultimately, that the lender is going to get a copy of it anyway because he's going to require that a home inspection be done. Doing it by a seller really reflects, okay, what things need to be fixed prior to, to uh, closing escrow, what, what things can be uh, negotiated. and uh, But ultimately, Marianne, I have to disagree with you because ultimately, the lender is going to get a copy of any home inspection or require, in many in many cases, a home inspection of the property in order to fund the loan. 
At least I've never had that place. request in Southern California, but maybe Jeff Green will um, have an opinion on this. I'm very familiar that in Northern California, everything is done and attached to the MLS. Um, so an appraiser would be pulling the physical, the septic, the uh, right off the MLS in Northern California. Is, is that that's I know that's more common toward the Bay side. Is that common where you are, Jeff? No, in the central part and northern part of the state, it's very seldom that reports are put on on the MLS unless you have a clearance. If you have a complete clearance, yes, but home inspection well, reports, absolutely not. I'm not saying put it on the MLS. I'm saying have them provided. Right. When no, the person wants to make an asking if, they, if we do that here, and we don't. Um, I I wasn't sure that uh, I. Um, I have a, an agent I take care of up in uh, Northern California on the transaction coordinating side. And they, um, I mean, everything, she does everything from the very beginning. And that seems to be the way up there. In fact, I think it was one of your agents, Jeff, that told me that uh, that uh, you, requests for repairs are are down in that environment because you you go into it knowing what the situation was. Oh. So my, my point is, is that, yeah. they, when, that when, I'm sorry, go ahead. Really, really hot. The, and people are writing offers with no contingencies. That's where you see all these reports and everything up front, so people can read them before they write their offer. But uh, the vast majority of the area, that's that's not happening. Well, um, that was a good debate on that subject because it did give me some it did give me some concern, Roger. And I'm glad that um, we talked that out a little bit. Um, I'd like to talk about now um, how to degree, disagree with a completed appraisal, Roger. Okay. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to, if, if it's a bank appraisal, you'll want to go um, to the AMC or whomever ordered it and say, can I talk with the real estate appraiser? Because I have questions with regards to the appraisal. And these are the, these are the questions. Um, sometimes the, they'll allow you to talk to the appraiser and then, it, you know, and if the appraiser uh, won't answer your questions or whatever, then um, I would uh, take it back to their AMC or whomever ordered the appraisal because they're supposed to look at at uh, your um, concerns um, with regards to uh, looking at additional comps that that uh, may be uh, prevalent that the you know maybe the agent uh, didn't catch or the appraiser didn't catch or you know changes that you thought might be necessary given that you are an expert on that property um i have I found know. that if if i talk to an uh, an appraiser um it's tough to get them to change anything um, unless you give them a comparable or two that uh, they either did not find or um they give you an explanation of why they didn't use that comparable. Um, I have short on this. I'm short sorry. of that, um, if you're getting one who won't deal with you or whatever, then I would, you know, register a complaint. Um, there, I have a link on the screen there for you that'll be in the package that you request after uh, um, on how to read and how to review a report. Um, I also thought this was an interesting slide, uh, Roger, in that uh, the review appraiser, once their rep uh, report is received on the lending end, um, could slash the value um, because the, of the lender's risk. It's their money. They make the rules. Um, can you talk well, about that? Well, that's what we find is, is a lot of times the marketing tool is, you know, we're going to give you 100% value or whatever. Um, what we have found, at least with lenders, um, is is that many times, like if it's a difficult property or an unusual property, they are in effect want us to be their underwriters so they they're not the bad people. Um, that normally doesn't happen on conforming properties, um, but sometimes if you have an underimproved property, um, particularly on large properties that are going to be very, uh, you know, the million dollar, three quarter of a million dollar in maybe the property's not being used to its highest and best use, they're not going to necessarily want uh, and have certain guidelines 
to cut those appraisals because um, they're they're wanting to limit their risk and they're wanting to uh, decide well, what's this person going to do with the property, um, and and we want to know that we are well positioned to take this loan if that happens. In other words, there was one I can remember where it was up in Duluth, and then it's a beautiful property, but the seller had not built a custom home, and he had a pad for a custom home and a pad for a go, uh, tennis court, but he had a small two bedroom house on it with a 10 car garage and irrigated pastures and whatever. And he wanted us to cut the value and we did not. I just said, you know, we're valuing it at market. If you choose to want to cut the value, that's up to your underwriter. Actually, I have a question that kind of goes along with that from Bill Brooks, who's live on Facebook right now. And he's asking, why does an appraiser ask the listing agent what the agreed upon sell price is? And that um, he's been asked that a number of times, and it, it's as though the appraiser doesn't know what the agreed upon sell price is. So that's live from Facebook right now. Well, many times we don't. Uh, it's not reported by the lender, um, and it's part of our due diligence. We have to put whatever listings or sales are in, you know, uh, in the last three years, but certainly the one that's being um, appraised we need to know what it's being sold at. Um, that's a requirement, it's gotta go in there and normally we ask for uh, a copy of signed escrow instructions or a copy of the purchase agreement that's signed by both parties because in the past we've seen purchase agreements that have not been signed by one party uh, or we don't get escrow instructions and we find out later after we've completed the appraisal that the price has changed. Um, and something that I think you all need to know, and this is my philosophy, we're, we're supposed to give you a market value. The market value, nine times out of 10, is the value that a willing buyer and a willing seller without undue influence has negotiated. So when we get the sale price of a property, we're in a position, we want to make sure that it's a good deal for the buyer and the seller as well as protects the lender. And so if you find uh, the sale price is within the range that the appraiser comes up with, then it's a fair deal for both parties. So many times people will ask, well, why, why is the sale price the, the appraisal price? Well, it's because it fell within this range. It's a fair deal for both parties. And this is just the, the meeting of the minds for this, for this property. All right, I also have another question from Brandon saying, what about homes that are nicer than the comps in terms of remodels and condition? Would there be an allowance for a higher price? In what way? And next, how do appraisers determine the value for the better home? And it, that goes hand in hand with the previous question too that was asked from Lisa Meyer saying, do you have a list you can give out for average price adjust adjustments like a bedroom pool, et cetera? Um, we don't. Uh, we have kind of norms we use, but we always test it in the market. And the reason I say that is, is that your adjustment in the desert for a pool is going to be different than an adjustment for a pool in San Diego. Um, your adjustment for uh, bathroom fixtures in a home that's, let's say, excellent quality is going to be different than a home that has average quality. Um, we have various How do you decide what that difference is, I guess, is well, we, we let the market example. do it. We try we try and find sales that will bracket our property. So we'll look for for homes that have been completely refurbished, some that have been somewhat refurbished, some that may not be refurbished. And then based on the market data and how we look at it, um, we come up with uh, adjustments accordingly. Um, and we use match pairs, we use cost, we use contributory value, um, we use historical market data, um, and we try to let the market dictate what the adjustments should be. Um, one of the questions we have here too is, uh, if a low appraisal has received a transaction and the buyer decides to cancel, um, uh, they're asking how, um, does this become a material fact 
uh, to the property and does it have to be disclosed to all future buyers? Before he answers as to the appraisal question, I want to tell you that this is a question that was posed to CAR uh, in my CAR certification training class. And Neil Kalen, the head of uh, the, the second uh, attorney in charge of CAR, said that their attorneys are evenly divided on whether a printed appraisal is an opinion or a uh, a material fact. Um, he said they have never come to the conclusion. There is not a car rule about it. Um, in general, the understanding is that they are an opinion and that they do not have to be shared. They are not a, a condition report. They're not an inspection. They're a price opinion. Um, there are some rules as to how long an FHA VA sticks with you, but um, Roger may be able to answer to that part of the question. Well, my understanding is is that when you do an appraisal, it's really it's really the buyer's appraisal. It's not the seller's appraisal. Um, they're paying for it, or the lender's paying for it. But it it you know a copy of it goes to the to the buyer. Um, a seller normally doesn't get a copy of it unless the seller's agent chooses to want to get a copy of it, um, and then utilize that to maybe renegotiate the deal or the deal's already made and they want it for their record. But my understanding is it is it is not something that needs to be shared because uh, it wasn't paid for by um, the seller and um, it really is the property of the lender who was going to make the loan as the client for the appraiser. And uh, if, the, if the seller calls up and says, I want a copy of the appraisal, um, and they call the appraiser, the appraiser is not legally able to give that a copy of the appraisal to the seller without written approval of release by the lender or the client. Um, um, so in answer FHA, to your questions, no. FHA and VA, um, traditionally that value, maybe Richard can answer this. Richard, you still with us? Yes, yes, I'm here. Hey, <laughs> surprise. Hey, um, do you want to talk about the how long an FHA VA appraisal stays with the property or stays it becomes a factor in the loan if it comes in low? Yeah. I understood it was about six months that an FHA VA uh, appraisal would stick with you after. Well, um, I, I, I don't know how long it would the exact time on how long it stays. I do know that generally if there's a VA appraisal done on a property um, and let's say the value doesn't come in, yeah, you can't just go to another lender, have them order another VA appraisal and hope that it is, uh, you know, hope that it comes in higher because once it's a, a VA appraisal is done, it can transfer from lender to lender. Um, as far as how long that stays, I mean, I can find out. Um, I, I had generally heard six months, so um, wow. that's, um, that's what, uh, the rule of thumb I use for that. Um, uh, moving on now, uh, there's a there's we're getting a lot of bulletins, Roger, about these new automated value method um, that some lenders are going to use. That seems very confusing to me because it seems like appraisals age, and that with an increase in the market, you're going to have an increase. So how's that going to work? What are what, what's the what's the pros and cons there of the automated value? Well, an automated value is really a statistical analysis using regression analysis um, and standard deviations to come up with with what they believe a value is of your property given what's published in public records or um, you know or other sources such as um, you know other listing sources. Um, what do you think the benefit is to the I don't know that there is a benefit it kind of gives you a range but the problem is is that to do it correctly you need a, a number of different data points and if you're in a market that doesn't have a lot of data points and you have to go back more than one cycle um, and I'm talking about economic cycle uh, it has a tendency to to um, thwart the the ability for it to be uh, reasonable. Um, that's one of the reasons they give you a range and then their opinion. Uh, we find for the most part, because uh, somebody hasn't re 
seen the property, reviewed the property, looked at the, uh, you know, inspected the property, that in many cases those are, uh, in most cases, they're under undervaluing a property. Is this going to replace traditional uh, appraisal to any degree? Uh, they already have. Um, more, okay. more and more lenders are, um, particularly on refinances or, or on um, um, lines of credit or whatever, are using AVMs or doing desktop appraisals. Um, I just had one done in, in my for my home, and in my opinion, they were thirty or forty thousand dollars under what the value of the property was, but they wouldn't change it, and they basically stated that uh, you know we do an AVM and that's how we do it, and if you want the loan, this is what we do. If you don't want the loan, go someplace else. Um, I see. And uh, I find that um, if you need a hundred data points to do something, and I asked the question of this when I went to a seminar, and, and they basically state, well, you're gonna have outliers above and below, and uh, you know the majority of them will be in this range, and that's how we deal with it. Um, so I personally call it garbage in, garbage out, because each data point is gotten not necessarily from an appraisal, unless you have lenders that are collecting data from each appraisal they are, they uh, they purchase and then put that in their database that might be a little more um, detailed but um, if you're not looking at the property or or knowing what's been done inside because more and more people are not permitting getting going out and getting a building permits for saying let's changing floor covers or redoing their kitchen they're only getting permits if they're adding they're adding space or they're doing electrical or plumbing that would require a, a, a permit. Other than that, any upgrades or refurbishments of homes, 99% of the time the homeowner is not going in and getting a building permit to do that. And you would not know that unless you inspected the property. Is, right. uh, is Are the Zillow estimates a version of AVMs? Yes, to my knowledge, yes. I see. That would explain the constantly having to explain them um, being off. Um, well, Tracy, I think that's you... one of oh, the sorry. things that are attracting attracting people to Zillow is, hey, you know, I think my property is worth this. And Zillow, I find many times, though, it's over overvalued as opposed to AVMs that you can get on public records and MLS. On your MLS, if you pull, let's say, a, a subject property, uh, at least on the MLS IMR, which is CRMLS, they have um, the ability to do an AVM right there um, based on the information they have in public records. Like, like I said, the, um, the devil's in the details. So if you have no detail and your house is substantially better than the neighborhood or whatever, that's going to be a low valuation. Um, interesting. I... Um... I am one tip I wanted to share with everybody today for especially for the newer agents on on, on our team um, appraisals are confidential to the buyer they're not required to be given to the listing side also you traditionally do not want to reveal if your appraisal came in over accepted price uh, the only time you're going to be revealing that number is if you're requesting a price reduction for a lower appraisal um the finding out two things happen when you tell them a price and it's over what they accepted the seller feels bad and they're mad at their realtor and they don't want to do any repairs so um i, I wanted to remind everybody that you the, um, appraisals are confidential unless you are asking for something from the seller side you do not have to reveal um uh, uh what the price uh is i bought my house um 18 months ago for 415,000 um, using a year old comp and um, we um, we actually came in at 455 um, that's not something I'm gonna uh, have to tell the seller and make them feel bad about so um, and it will interfere with your repairs because they think you've already gotten value so I want to make sure you guys uh, knew that um, before we yeah I have uh, Mercedes Zepeda just was just asking on an older home that was built in 1961, should the sellers be worried with a VA offer? Well, 
I always ask what the property condition is because it's more under repairs that you're going to have concerns with, Roger, wouldn't you say, as far as the loan goes, um, the value is the value. Right. We don't deal with age or whatever other than with the, the uh, you know, inspecting the property, um, hopefully getting in something like that, a home inspection to know what issues there might be, um, making sure the foundation's in good shape, um, you know, walking walking the entire property to see if there's any if you if we feel any uh, uh, movement on the floor or whether it's not level or whatever. Um, you know, older homes have other problems such as you know uh, pipes that aren't aren't plastic or excuse me aren't uh, copper. Uh, they may have uh, stain or not stainless steel but regular steel um, pipes for um, uh, for plumbing for toilets and whatever and ultimately one needs to know that in the future if it has to be replumbed or whatever that can be very expensive but that should also show up in our value opinion because we would be looking at homes that uh, have not had uh, work done had work done and you know appraisers try to bracket um, their value opinion um, only because the market is so inexact with regard to buyers and sellers' motivations, uh, the economy, um, how well the neighborhood is is uh, looked at, is it in a good school district, things like that. So that's one of the reasons we try to stay in the neighborhood, stay with um, you know age-appropriate comp comparables to the subject property, and uh, you know make adjustments accordingly. All right, thank you for that. Uh I'm uh, we're about we're just about to wrap up now. I want to check one more time for questions from the listeners or from our brokers. Or we have two or... more from our from a listener from Fag de Garcia. She's saying, okay. how do we separate the cost of a house from the cost of the land of the same house? Meaning I have two similar houses, but one has five acres of land and the other one has 20 acres. Well, that's one of the reasons that appraisals on land are more expensive because the appraiser has to go out and find uh, properties, uh, land sales, to understand what the difference is in uh, value between five acres and 20 acres. Um, one thing that will help you in, in not, um, without having to do an appraisal, is go to public records and find out what the allocation of land value is to the sales price that the appraisers or the uh, assessors put on it. That's kind of a simple way and that's one way we look at it, but by and large, we try to estimate what the market says the difference between a five acre and a 20 acre parcel. In some cases, we find that, that there's not much difference because somebody who has 20 acres has a lot more maintenance than somebody that has five acres and improving the 20 acres as opposed to the five acres is can be much more cost of, uh, costly and the maintenance of water and stuff like that is much more costly. So really just depends on the market. It looks on how people look at five and 20 acre parcels. Uh, typically 20 acre parcels may be a little more rural than five acre parcels or they may not. And, and basically uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, it's really in the eyes of the market, um, and you know that's how I would answer that question. Richard had another one for us, Tracy. Yeah, Richard has one actually. Yeah, Roger, I had a question because uh, I come across this uh, quite a bit in lending. Um, Non-permitted additions on properties. Um, you know, I think the consensus is well, you can't give value to a, you know an addition, a bedroom. From my understanding, you can give value to something unpermitted. Obviously, it's not going to be considered like a permitted addition, but as long as it's done in a workmanlike fashion, there can be some value given to, uh, to that. Yes, uh, we do that all the time. We look and see, the, we compare the quality of the permitted uh, improvements with the quality of the unpermitted improvements. And if we see that they're similar, we will give value. It'll be less value. And the difference is likely the cost to get that that area permitted, um, but we do give value for that. 
but even in uh, there's a place in Corona where people had been putting in unpermitted granny flats that the uh, uh, the market recognized the unpermitted granny flats even though they were unpermitted so they were given full value so it really is depending on how the market looks at it if we don't have any clear-cut information with regards to it then we will give value to it if if um, they're built to the specifications, like I said, of, of the permitted stuff. Some cases we have people that have just uh, converted a garage and it's very, let's put it this way, very rustic. <laughs> yeah, um, great way to put it. We, yeah. we, in that case, may not give any, any value other than the two-car garage, as opposed to if it was done in a in a workmanlike manner, we would give some value on it, but it would many times be offset by the fact that you had no uh, covered parking, which now is a is is a requirement in most ven or most communities. Great, thank you. Great, yeah, that's all the questions that we have on our end, Roger and MJ. I uh, I asked this question in the mini interview as well. Is there anything, Roger, you've always wanted to say to a thousand real estate agents? At once, any last thoughts for us? <laughs> uh, last thoughts are is uh, be very knowledgeable about the property that you're listing or, uh, you know, representing a buyer on because they're, you're going to be the go-to person and that's how you create your wealth and expertise to that party as opposed to them going to Zillow or going to some other place that, that is all done by computers. Uh, recognize that there's always going to be now with all the of the computer computer technology and databases being used that it's, there's going to be a real pressing issue on commissions and you have to prove your net worth and the commissions you're charging based on your expertise and that that is knowing the property you're selling or buying really well. That's really great advice, um, and um, we're sure happy to have you, Roger, here in our territory. We feel very lucky um, that you're so gracious with your time. Um, I, do, um, I do caution uh, our listeners. Um, I did provide us contact information, but please use it wisely, and, um, and keep in mind that he does not charge for those answers, so um, we want to treat him well when we reach out to him. Um, is there, if there's nothing else, I think that does it. Roger, we're very, again, very happy to have you. And um, unless anyone has anything else, I believe we're done. I think that is everything. So I would like to thank every everyone so much for joining us today. And a huge thank you to Mary Jane and to Roger, Roger and to Richard from Movement Mortgage. I would like to thank everybody and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye.